Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're getting into the next Napoleon video, Battle of the Nations. Let's go. October 1813. Napoleon Bonaparte faced his greatest crisis since becoming Emperor of the French nine years before. His long war in Spain had ended in defeat, and an Anglo-Spanish-Portuguese army had now crossed the Pyrenees to invade France itself. In Germany, the Kingdom of Bavaria had switched sides and joined the Sixth Coalition against France. While in Saxony, Napoleon faced four armies converging on him from all directions. What's more, these were not the same bunglers he'd crushed in 1805 and 6 at Austerlitz and Jena. Prussia, Austria and Russia had all learned from their mistakes. They were now better organised, trained and led, and more wary of Napoleon. Yeah, so we talked about this in the comments of the last video, and I talked about it some in the last video itself. This is a totally different army that Napoleon is facing. They have not only learned from their mistakes in the past and have implemented better training, they have totally different recruitment and conscription and that sort of stuff, but also they have learned from their successes in Spain and in Russia, and they have taken the things that have been successful and implemented them into the overall strategy here against Napoleon. So it's just a totally, totally different set of circumstances that Napoleon faces here than he has with the past coalitions. The largest coalition force was the Army of Bohemia, commanded by Austrian Field Marshal, the Prince of Schwarzenberg. His was a huge mixed Austrian-Russian-Prussian army of 194,000 men and 790 guns. Damn, 790 guns, wow. To the north, Blücher's army of Silesia, and the army of the north under Napoleon's ex-marshal Bernadotte, now Crown Prince of Sweden. Together, 130,000 men and 536 guns. To the southeast, General Benningsen's army of Poland, besieging Dresden. Another 34,000 men and 135 guns. In total, the coalition had fielded 360,000 men and 1,500 guns, with Russia supplying the bulk of the troops. One unique addition to Bernadotte's Army of the North was a single troop of British rocket artillery, an experimental weapon system based on the Congreve rocket a type seen here in 1830. Although wildly inaccurate, their high-explosive warhead could be devastating at close range. Wow, so they implemented basically like what would be modern shells. That's, that's wild. Napoleon's forces around Leipzig were outnumbered almost two to one. But with 200,000 men and 700 guns, the Grande Armée was still a force to be reckoned with, with many experienced troops and commanders, even though it increasingly relied on young conscripts to make up numbers. There were another 140,000 men that Napoleon could not call on. General Rapp's 10th Corps besieged in Danzig, Marshal Saint-Cyr's 1st Corps besieged in Dresden. Marshal Davout's 13th Corps holding Hamburg. As well as several smaller besieged garrisons across Germany and Poland. Napoleon was currently about 20 miles north of Leipzig with the bulk of his army. Marshal Murat was 40 miles to the south with 90,000 men covering Schwarzenberg. Napoleon now decided to rapidly join Murat, and with their temporary superiority in numbers, defeat Schwarzenberg, before Bernadotte and Blücher could intervene. Murat had orders to conduct a fighting withdrawal northwards. 
but at Liebertwogwitz he was drawn into major combat with the enemy's advance guard. Around 12,000 horsemen fought what some have described as the largest cavalry battle in Europe's history. Murat, in the thick of it as usual, was very nearly captured by Prussian dragoons. The battle ended in a minor coalition victory, with around 2,000 casualties on each side. The next day, Napoleon arrived to take command. This video is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus, home of more than 11,000 on-demand video lectures, covering everything plus.com slash epic history tv or click on the link in the video description thank you to the great courses plus yeah for sponsoring go support this video. epic history the, these videos really are great that is such a different that is such a different mindset like that this quote is just such a different mindset than than what we've seen throughout the the course of this series by the 16th of october napoleon had concentrated most of his forces south of leipzig field marshal schwarzenberg meanwhile against russian advice had deployed his army on either side of the Pleiser River, which would hinder his movements throughout the battle. Napoleon had entrusted the northern sector to Marshal Ney, with orders to keep an eye out for Blücher and Bernadotte. But Napoleon didn't expect them for at least another day, and so Ney had orders to transfer most of his troops south for the attack on Schwarzenberg. Schwarzenberg, however, knew that Blücher and Bernadotte were closer than Napoleon suspected, and that Bennigsen was also marching up from Dresden. This was the whole thing, right? Napoleon always had speed on his side. He surprised enemies over and over and over. That led to, you know, the, the total collapse of the enemy at a lot of these battles, or a lot of these former battles. And now you see speed on the other side is starting to get the better of Napoleon. Before I go further, what in the hell? I can't, I can't remember who that is down there. But why is he deployed in the middle of all of these different like rivers and creeks? Like why didn't he just go to the other side of the river? That, that makes no sense to me. He's literally just tied his army down in a really weird place down there. But anyway, one of y'all in the comments can explain that to me maybe. This was the moment the coalition had been waiting for. All their armies converging on Napoleon with overwhelming superiority in numbers. However, the coalition's headquarters were nothing like Napoleon's, where one man's will decided all. Schwarzenberg had to attempt to coordinate the actions of three large armies from three separate states. And although he was commander-in-chief, his plans still needed to be approved by Emperor Alexander, the supreme commander, whilst he also managed relations with the King of Prussia and the Emperor of Austria. All of so you have a similar thing playing out here as you did with the Soviet Union, where because you have a political advisor always there and everything has to be run through like the political headquarters it slows everything down it makes everything seem like this huge task to get done that's kind of what is happening here with yeah you have some somebody in charge but even they aren't really in charge and they have to placate to other people and they have somebody that they are you know they have a direct superior even and so this this is interesting here. ...of whom were present at his headquarters. The plan finally agreed was for General Wittgenstein's corps group to lead an attack in four main columns, with two Austrian flanking attacks west of the Pleiser. 
At 8am, a bombardment began along the line, as Russian, Austrian and Prussian infantry regiments advanced across cold, muddy fields. Wachau soon fell to Russian infantry, but French artillery fire made it impossible for them to advance further. Victor's second corps then counterattacked, retaking the village at Bayonet Point. Wachau would change hands twice more that morning. These bloody contests for small Saxon villages would come to typify the fighting around Leipzig. At Markleberg, Kleist's Prussian 2nd Corps drove out the Polish defenders after bitter fighting. While on the left bank of the Pleiser, Merveldt's Austrian 2nd Corps struggled across broken ground to attack well-defended villages. Their assault on Konowitz stalled, but with heavy losses the Austrians got a toehold in Derlitz. On the right flank, around 10am, Klenau's 4th Corps occupied the high ground of the Kolmberg, and fought its way into Liebert Volkwitz. Napoleon, observing from Gallows Hill, ordered up Augereau's 9th Corps and the Young Guard in support. Macdonald's 11th Corps was now also arriving in position on his left. His troops retook the Kolmberg and counterattacked Liebert Wolfwitz, driving out the Austrians and pursuing them over the fields beyond. The advance was only halted when Russian Cossacks were sighted on their open left flank, a warning that Bennigsen's army was not far off. I've said it a million times in this series, but the Cossacks are so awesome. The coalition offensive was going nowhere, with most of its modest gains lost to French counterattacks. But there was one sector where the coalition had more success that morning. General Goulai's Austrian Third Corps, with orders to threaten Napoleon's line of retreat, advanced over marshy ground towards Lindenau. Ney had to divert Bertrand's Fourth Corps to reinforce the village and ensure the road to France was kept open. Napoleon was waiting for Ney's reinforcements before launching his attack on Schwarzenberg, but now Fourth Corps was tied down at Lindenau and there was more bad news from Ney. Blücher's army of Silesia was approaching from the northwest. Marmont's 6th Corps had had to turn about to keep the Prussians at bay. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. This only works if nobody is coming down from the north, right? Like the whole layout and, and battle plan here for Napoleon and the, the French only works if they really are a few days away from getting to the battlefield. But if they're not, this whole thing goes south kind of quickly, but depending on if they can get there in force or not. Heavy fighting broke out around Merkern, the village itself held by elite French Marines. While Dombrovsky's Polish division clung on to Widrich under attack from an entire Russian corps. This was a nasty surprise for Napoleon, who'd thought Blücher was still a day's march away. But the old Prussian general, hearing cannon fire to the south, had urged his men on and into the attack. Blücher intended to draw as many French troops onto himself as possible to assist Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia. His actions and the bloody fight for Merkern may just have saved the coalition from defeat. What a badass, right? He did, like, this isn't modern day where you have this constant communication back and forth. He's marching down there to the battlefield. He hears the cannons going off and he's like, you know what? Let's get as many troops as possible from the area focused on us, right? Charge in, blow the trumpets, like, let's get all eyes on us, or as many eyes on us as possible. Not really knowing 
where in the battle everything lies, but just like, this is the best thing to do. What, what a cool move. Napoleon was outnumbered across the whole battlefield. But in the south he still had a numerical advantage. Not as large as he'd hoped, nor likely to last long. Schwarzenberg and Alexander were already moving up reserves, though Schwarzenberg now found that his were on the wrong side of the Pleiser River. That's what I was saying. What is he doing over there? Like, what is he doing over there? Costing precious hours. It was now or never for Napoleon. At 2 p.m., he ordered the attack to begin. A grand battery of 180 guns blasted the enemy lines. Then Victor's 2nd Corps, Lauriston's 5th Corps and the Young Guard began their advance. In support, Murat gathered two entire cavalry corps, 10,000 horsemen, and led them in one of the great mass cavalry charges of the Napoleonic Wars. How many awesome cavalry charges has Murat been a part of since this whole thing started? I feel like there's been quite a few. Cuirassiers of the 1st Heavy Cavalry Division broke through to the main enemy battery. Some even nearly reached the three coalition monarchs. Wow. But the ground was marshy and broken by fences and ditches. The French horses were soon exhausted and the squadrons disordered. Austrian cuirassiers and Russian Guard cavalry were coming up from the south. When these fresh Allied cavalry reserves charged the French, a great melee ensued. But the French were eventually driven back to their start line. Maison's division of the 5th Corps was involved in a desperate struggle for Gelden Gossa. The fighting swept back and forth through the village, the streets filling with dead and wounded from both sides. But as Russian and Prussian guard regiments arrived to reinforce the village, the French were forced to fall back. Around 4pm, the Austrian Reserve Corps finally arrived and renewed the assault on Markleberg, one of the morning's objectives, which was finally secured. By 5pm it was clear that Napoleon didn't have enough reserves to force a decisive outcome in the south. To the north, Merkern was being stubbornly held by French marines with lethal close-range artillery support. But despite terrible losses, York's Prussian Corps continued to attack. Marshal Marmont himself was wounded twice, but remained in command. Finally, a brilliant charge by Prussian Hussars triggered a French rout. Merkern fell as Marmont's corps streamed back towards Leipzig. As dusk fell around 6 pm, fighting died out across the battlefield. The first day of the battle had cost the French an estimated 25,000 casualties. The coalition, at least 30,000. I know that this is not Napoleon's style for a lot of this stuff, but with how many men the Allied group has there with the coalition numbers and guns, and the fact that they are literally everywhere, right? Like, they are all around you. Um, I think I would dip. I think I would get out of there and live to fight another day without these circumstances, right? Like, sure, you might be able to hold out, and you might even be able to force more days where the coalition has more casualties than you. But all in all, these are not the best circumstances for you to be fighting on if you're Napoleon. I think I would have gotten out of there and, like I said, just tried to fight another day in maybe a little bit of a different circumstance. 
Napoleon had come close, but failed to land a decisive blow. The chance for victory was slipping from his grasp. Sunday the 17th of October brought a lull, with both armies exhausted by the previous day's fighting. Napoleon needed to rest his troops and resupply them with ammunition, which was running dangerously low. He also sent a message to his father-in-law, Emperor Francis I, suggesting an armistice and finally offering concessions. But the Allies were no longer interested. They knew time was on their side. Yeah, and they won it all now. Like, you had the chance to... I talked about this at the end of the last video. The opportunity was there for Napoleon to keep the throne and really to keep the empire, although it would have been massively, you know, kind of shrunk down. He didn't want that. He wanted it all. Well, now that he's outnumbered and surrounded, they want it all. Like, they're not interested in negotiations the same way that Napoleon wasn't. The only major combat that day occurred in the north, where Blücher continued to attack. Russian infantry stormed Eutrich and Gorlis. Russian hussars charged and routed part of Arigi's 3rd Cavalry Corps. That day, Napoleon received 14,000 reinforcements when Rainier's French Saxon 7th Corps arrived from the northeast. But the same day, the coalition received more than 100,000 reinforcements, Damn. as their armies continued to converge on Leipzig. Colorado's Austrian 1st Corps. Bennigsen's Army of Poland. And Bernadotte's Army of the North though the latter was widely criticised for his leisurely march to the battlefield. The next day, Napoleon would face odds of nearly two to one. It was time for the Emperor to begin planning his retreat. Yeah, I would say it's time. Like I said, once the first day's over and you see the direction this is going, it's time to, in my opinion, like, it's time to get out of there. Like, you fight another day. Whenever the, the armies that are converging on your point that are, you know, of, of the Allies, while they're still on the march to Leipzig, you should be, you know, focused on trying to get out of there. That way, everybody isn't here to chase you out. Monday morning, the sun shone across 40 square miles of battlefield, on which nearly half a million troops and 2,000 cannon were assembled. Soldiers from France, Germany, Russia, Austria, Poland, Italy, Sweden, the Netherlands and even Britain. This was truly the Battle of the Nations. In preparation for his withdrawal, Napoleon pulled back his forces into a tighter, defensive perimeter, and ordered Bertrand's 4th Corps to march west to secure the army's line of retreat. Two divisions of the Young Guard under Marshal Mortier took their place at Lindenau. Schwarzenberg, meanwhile, planned to close the net on Napoleon with six converging attacks. I'm curious to see how this plays out with Napoleon having waited now. With all of the forces being concentrated, I'm curious to see exactly how he tries to maneuver his way out of here. Fighting in the south began around 8am. The Austrians took Dörlitz, 
but Marshal Oudinot led a counter-attack at the head of a Young Guard division and drove them out again. Schwarzenberg was so alarmed by this reverse that he sent orders to recall Gulai's 3rd Corps. General Barclay's troops initially faced little opposition as they took Wachau and Liebert Volkwitz, scenes of such bitter fighting two days before, but now scarcely defended. Barclay then paused, waiting for Bennigsen to get into position on his right before continuing his attack. Bennigsen's troops had more ground to cover, but towards noon they'd driven back Macdonald's infantry and taken their objectives. They would now wait for Bernadotte's army to link up on their right, but the Army of the North was again making slow progress, for which many again blamed its commander, who seemed exceedingly cautious about facing his old master in battle. Okay, somebody explain to me what's going on here. Is Bernadotte really being as slow as they're making now? And if so, why? Like, is there a is there a reason that's like logistical, or is there something else going on? Like, what's what's the reasoning for it here? Blücher, in contrast, did not hesitate to launch Russian infantry against Leipzig's north. Yeah, Blücher doesn't give a damn. He's just going all in all the time. Northern defenses, though their attack failed with heavy losses. By 2 p.m., Napoleon was hard pressed on all fronts, but holding his own. His attention was now focused on Probstheide, key to his southern front, under attack from Kleist's Prussian 2nd Corps. French troops had turned the village into a fortress and inflicted terrible losses on the advancing Prussians. Probstheide was soon engulfed in smoke and fire as fighting raged on all sides. Some Prussian regiments lost half their men attacking the village, while three French generals were killed as they organised its defence. Napoleon even sent in Friant's division of the guard to reinforce the position. To the north, Bernadotte's army was finally joining the battle in earnest. Marmont had assembled 137 guns around Schoenefeld, which poured fire into the Russian ranks. In response, Bernadotte massed 200 guns of his own. The fields were so Yeah, Bernadotte's the same kind of fighter. He he came up in the in the same kind of like thought process that you you use the artillery in a in an overwhelming fashion, like that that's what they're used for. Soon strewn with the dead and wounded, as the sheer weight of fire made it impossible for either side to advance. Around 3 p.m., von Bülow's Prussian Corps, supported by Austrian Jaegers and its small British rocket detachment, attacked Poundsdorf. Grenier's 7th Corps could not withstand the onslaught. An hour later, around 3,000 Saxon soldiers rushed over to the enemy and surrendered. The Saxons were deeply disillusioned with their French allies. Their main wish now was for a quick end to a war that had ravaged their homeland for many months. The hole in the line created by the Saxons' defection was soon plugged by guard cavalry. But the coalition juggernaut could not be stopped. Towards dusk, under relentless Russian pressure, Marmont abandoned the burning ruins of Schoenefeld, while the Prussians took Sellerhausen. In the south, Probstheide still held but the situation was grim for Napoleon. The third day's fighting cost both sides 
another 25,000 casualties. Napoleon's army was exhausted, outnumbered, virtually encircled, and critically low on ammunition. Finally, the Emperor gave the order to retreat. Overnight, under cover of darkness and early morning fog, the French army withdrew behind Leipzig's walls, and at 4am began its retreat west, crossing the single bridge over the Elster River that led back to France. There'd been time and materials to build extra bridges, but in what would prove a serious oversight, no one had given the necessary orders. You are freaking kidding me. They had... What? Furthermore, there was no clear plan for Leipzig's defence, which was left to a jumble of understrength units, mostly Poles and Germans. Napoleon left Leipzig around 10am. Behind him there were scenes of mounting chaos and confusion, the city's streets jammed with troops, guns and wagons. The 20,000 wounded troops in the city had little hope of escape. 30 minutes later, shells began to rain on the city, as the coalition launched an all-out assault from north, east and south. The rearguard held the city's gates for as long as they could, but they were soon overwhelmed by the enemy and savage street fighting broke out across the city. A barge packed with gunpowder had been moored beneath the Elster Bridge, so that it could be quickly destroyed after the rearguard crossed. Around 2pm, a corporal lit the fuse when he saw Russian soldiers on the far bank, even though the bridge was still packed with troops, wagons and horses. The bridge was destroyed in a gigantic explosion that trapped 30,000 men and 30 generals on the wrong side of the river. Panic broke out among those who suddenly found themselves cut off. Most became prisoners, but some tried to swim for it, including the Polish Prince Poniatowski, made a marshal by Napoleon just three days before. Weak from his wounds, he rode his horse into the river, but as it tried to climb the steep far bank, it rolled over him, and he was drowned. Marshal Macdonald had also been cut off by the blast, and resolved to escape or die trying. So the generals and marshals are, they're kind of been in, in a position where I can understand why they're trying to make a run for it, right? But if you're a normal troop here, if you're a regular rank and file troop, what's your move? Like, what do you do? The, the bridge is blown, you may be wounded, um, or you're certainly exhausted from fighting, but now you have no way out, there's an enemy army that's literally coming in, sweeping into the city, what, what's your move? What do you do? I'm, I'm trying to think of what my instinctual action would be. Maybe it would be to swim for it? Maybe it would be just to rip off all my stuff, go into a house and like, act like I'm a civilian, maybe a wounded civilian or something. I don't know. I don't know. I'm trying to think of like, what, what can they do now that they're blocked? What a wild event that they blew the bridge with so many people still on the other side. Man.
He found a place where engineers had cut down two trees as a makeshift bridge, and made his attempt. And there I was, one foot on either trunk and the abyss below me. A high wind was blowing. I was wearing a large cloak, and fearing that someone would grab at it, I got rid of it. I was already three quarters of the way across, when some men decided to follow me. Their unsteady feet caused the trunks to shake, and I fell into the water. Fortunately I could touch the bottom, but the bank was steep, the soil loose and slippery. Some of the enemy's skirmishers came up. They fired at me point blank, and missed me, and some of our men, who happened to be nearby, drove them off and helped me out. I was wet from head to foot, breathless and sweating heavily from my efforts. Marshal Marmont, who had got across early in the day, gave me a horse. I wanted dry clothes more, but they were not to be had. What a crazy story that is. And to think just a few more bridges could have made a huge difference here. A huge difference. I mean, think about it. There are people that are escaping like that guy just did on tree trunks. So, like, more bridges just totally changes everything about this. And instead, instead it turns into this just total chaos. The loss of the bridge turned what was already a heavy defeat for Napoleon into a disastrous one. Later that day, the three allied monarchs met in the centre of Leipzig to celebrate their great victory. It had come at enormous cost. Exact numbers are impossible to establish, but in four days fighting, the coalition armies suffered at least 52,000 casualties. Napoleon, who could less afford such losses, came off worse. 47,000 killed and wounded, 35,000 taken prisoner, 325 guns lost. More men were killed and wounded at Leipzig than in any European battle before the First World War. Sir George Jackson, the British ambassador to Austria, rode over the battlefield with Metternich, the Austrian foreign minister, two days later. A more revolting and sickening spectacle I never beheld, he wrote. Scarcely could we move forward a step without passing over the dead body of some poor fellow, gashed with wounds and clotted with blood, another perhaps without an arm or a leg, here and there a headless trunk, or a head only which caused our horses to stumble or start aside. It made one's blood run cold, to glance upon the upturned faces of the dead. We got over this field of glory as quickly as we could. Napoleon had suffered a calamitous defeat. He had lost the battle for Germany. His domination of Europe appeared at an end. With 80,000 survivors, he began a fighting retreat to the French border. There was now no chance of rescue for the 100,000 men trapped in garrisons across Germany and Poland, though some would hold out for another five months. Marshal Murat took his leave of the Emperor, assuring him of his loyalty, but secretly planning to cut a deal with the Allies to save his throne in Naples. It was the last time the two men saw each other. Eleven days after the Battle of Leipzig, Napoleon's former allies, the Bavarians, tried to block his escape at Hanau with 40,000 wow. men. The Bavarian commander, von Vreda, had served with Napoleon in many campaigns. But on seeing his deployment for battle, Napoleon remarked, I made him a count, but I couldn't make him a general. The That's messed up. French Emperor then ordered the Imperial Guard to lead an attack that forced the enemy to fall back in disarray. French army reached the safety of Mainz three days later. Napoleon himself pushed on to Paris, 
to contain the political damage from his defeat. Behind yeah, I don't want to be the one that have to tell you this, man, but um, there's a British army in France. Behind him, his empire was being dismantled. On the 4th of November, the coalition announced the dissolution of the Confederation of the Rhine, several of its former members now joining the war against France. In the Illyrian provinces, local revolts, Austrian invasion and British naval support brought an end to French rule. In North Italy, Eugène was retreating steadily before the advance of von Hiller's Austrian army. While in Hamburg, Marshal Davout, with 34,000 troops, would soon be cut off and under siege. Napoleon's situation was desperate. But in the next campaign, fought for France itself, Napoleon would prove that he was still the master of war. Okay, so that was Napoleon, Battle of the Nations. That was a great video. Um, like, comment, subscribe. Anything y'all want to talk about in the comments? Any answers any of y'all have to some of the questions I asked throughout here? Um, anything at all, uh, just put it in the comments below and we can talk about it. Uh, keep helping me build the channel over here and I will see you guys next time.